Hello and welcome. So uh, it's the summer, so I'm not expecting a large uh, group of people to attend, but um, everyone who's here, you're welcome. Um, I can see already we've got John and Patrick, which is great. Uh, Patrick, I think you may be at uh, around 100% attendance. That's fantastic. Uh, John, I recognise your name, so I think I've uh, I think I've seen you on the stream before. So that's fantastic. Anyone else who's here? I think we've got about uh, eight people on the on the call at the moment. Um, anyone else who's here, do feel free to uh, say hello in the chat. Um, looking forward to getting any questions that you might have. So if you uh, if you want to uh, if you want to ask a question, then do use the chat. And uh, as always, it's good to know a little bit about who's on the who's on the live stream. Uh, find out where you are, what sort of things you do. So uh, I seem to remember Patrick. You're also in the US, but can't quite remember which part. East Coast, maybe. Um, so, a um, little bit of irony. Uh, those of you who saw the uh, email that I sent out, um, and I said that I had originally planned to do this last week, and I'd originally planned to cover Pinbox Seven because that's the topical topic of the uh, of the moment, but it didn't arrive in time, and so uh, I sent out that email, and then shortly afterwards, the post arrived with. The Pinbot Guide. So we will definitely be talking about this um, in on the first Tuesday in September. Um, it's, I think, fantastic. Um, keep an eye out on the website because Monday morning my review, uh, print review, uh, written review of the Pinbox 7th edition goes out if you're interested in it. And also if you're interested in the Pinbox 7th edition, do take a look at the interview I did with Nada Rad. Uh, a few weeks ago. Nada is one of the core team of 14. That's two co-chairs and 12 core members, core team members. And so th they were the people who did the the hard work of basically starting from scratch with the Pinbot Guide. Anyone who has uh, seen earlier editions of the Pinbot Guide, whether it's 6, 5, 4, 3, 2 or 1, will find this to be a massive break uh, from the past. There is almost no point of contact apart from the fact that it contains the PMBOK, the Project Manager and Body of Knowledge, as the PMI now sees it, and it contains, I think it has done since the fourth edition, third edition maybe, uh, the um, ANSI standard for project management as well. But the standard has changed com almost completely. The Body of Knowledge has changed almost completely. This is a very, very different book, and uh, I'll take you through it um, on at the next live stream, first Tuesday in September. I should should know what uh, calendar date that is, but you can find it as well as I can. Uh, first Tuesday in September is on the same day uh, throughout the world, just at a different time. Um, but yes, if you want to find out what I think of it, um, headline is I really like it. Um, if you want to think, find out what I think about it and look at my summary of what it contains, um, keep an eye out. Monday morning, UK time. You know, so I think it's, uh, what would it be? I think it's 5 a.m. UTC. Um, I, publish, I will publish the article. Um, took me a whole day to write, having read through this. Um, and it's a kind of an analysis of what's in here and what I think of each element of it. So um, let's put the pin box side uh, out of the way. Um, it might come up in questions. I've noticed we've got a few more people join the chat um, because today we're actually going to talk about uh, virtual motivation, motivating a virtual team, which is, I think, a very topical topic as well. Um, let's see who else has joined the call. We've got Wayne from San Diego. Um, we've got uh, Moses from Nairobi in Kenya. Uh, Patrick, yes, East Coast, Connecticut. Good, I remember that. And Ken uh, from Fishhook Village, Cape Town City. So that's pretty good. We've got uh, two in Africa, two in North America. I'm in Europe, although politically not anymore, it turns out. Uh, UK left the European Union, but uh, geographically you can't you can't beat the realities of geophysics. Um, so Britain is still in Europe. Um, so that's great. JC, not sure where you're from, but you clapping high. Uh, so that's great. 
Um, do feel free to ask me any questions. Um, in fact, I'm going to ask you a question because it's it'd be helpful to to know. Um, have any of you seen read the seventh edition of the Pinbot Guide? Um, and if you have, what do you think of it? If you haven't, what are you hoping for? What are you fearing? Um, we're not going to talk about it a lot, but uh, it'd be interesting. My goodness, Alvin uh, from San Francisco. So it must be first thing in the morning for you. What would it be? Around about 9 a.m.? Uh, so <laughs> get yourself a cup of coffee. I <laughs> uh, don't know what time you get up. Uh, maybe you've been up for quite a while already. So great to see everyone here. Um, so there's the question I've just asked you about uh, Pinbot Guide. The other question I'll ask you is, do you need to motivate team members who are remote from you? Do you get involved in virtual um, uh, team leadership, virtual projects? Uh, and if so, um, what are your tips? What are your, uh, what are your concerns? What are your questions? Um, is it something you enjoy doing? And how does it compare with motivating people in the real world where you can actually meet with them physically and, uh, and look them in the eye directly with, without a, a camera lens between you. And uh, I mean, that camera lens is quite a big thing um, because I think a lot of people are intimidated by a camera. They're intimidated by seeing their own image on screen. And uh, so it, all these things compound to make uh, managing and motivating virtual team very difficult. Who else has just joined? Uh, Azuma from Birmingham, UK. Excellent. Well, I shall be driving past your manor um, on uh, on Friday evening because uh, I live in the south of England and my family and I, uh, we're all going to the north of England, to the Lake District, uh, on Friday night for our holidays. So um, so we'll be passing past Birmingham, um, I would guess, probably around 6pm. Uh, uh, probably looking to stop for some supper when we when we get past the nightmare that is the uh, uh, the M6 <laughs> around Birmingham. Um, not your fault, Azuma. Um, okay, Patrick says didn't do a deep dive yet. I assume that's into Pinbox Seven, um, but like that it's more compact. Yes, I mean it's the it's the smallest I think since the uh, since the first edition. Some at one point I did compile a list of page numbers for uh, one to six, and they've been growing and growing. Uh, the first edition is actually quite small. Um, here's my first edition, um, which was which ran in at 176 pages. Wow. And that included all the uh, contents, 274. So just kept it under uh, 100 pages more than the original edition. But it's, yeah, it's a very different document, um, and uh, it doesn't take, doesn't quite break your back when you carry it. Um, uh, Alvin says that uh, he is completely virtual. Wow, uh, his challenge, our challenge, is staying engaged. Only one person can talk at a time. It's hard to interject. Well, that should be the case in the real world as well. Um, so a tip for you, Alvin, is yes, the meet the formal part of the meeting needs to be kept orderly. Um, the software will help with that, I guess, or maybe hinder because it can. You can. I think some software will cut off people so that only one voice is speaking at a time. Um, but in the real world. When we gather together in a meeting room, the first part of the meeting is a free-for-all, isn't it? Before we, we, we're called to order, people chat amongst themselves. And I think it is a really good idea to try to encourage that during the early stage of, uh, of a virtual meeting. Carve out time for informal stuff. Now, it is harder because you, you can't kind of wander over to a corner of the room with a couple of people and have a chat um, but there are there is a possibility of group rooms so if you can kind of facilitate that or at least allow people unmediated conversation where people can break into each other's conversations uh, and and chat naturally I think that can really help uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through um, Manoj uh, love the way you share the knowledge. Uh, thank you very much. It's my pleasure. It's 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 what I do. Uh, ever since two thousand and two, 
Uh, I basically my job has been to share my knowledge. Uh, I've I've called myself a trainer. I've called myself a coach, an author, um, a video producer, a speaker, and I do all of that and more. Facilitator, uh, trusted advisor, but the common theme through all of that is sharing my knowledge. So maybe all I am is really just a teacher, um, and just a teacher is a ridiculous thing to say. Um, if you've ever had children or been a child, then you know the importance of teachers in our world. Um, so that's a really lovely thing to say, Manoj. Thank you. Um, uh, Madan says, he's from Nepal. Fantastic. Uh, it's great. So we've got Asia now as well. That's that's brilliant. Uh, so we've got uh, Europe, um, not, include, not, not just me, but uh, uh, we've got someone else in the UK. We've got uh, the United Northern uh, North America. Uh, we've got... Uh, Africa, North and uh, South Africa. Well, I guess Kenya's East Africa, isn't it? Um, kind of midway down, I think, Moses, if I remember rightly. Uh, and now we've got uh, Nepal. Um, fantastic country. Had a wonderful holiday there. Um, remember uh, rafting down some fantastic river. Loved it. Oh, hello from Lebanon. That's brilliant. We've got... Uh, um, Simon uh, is in the Lebanon. So Lebanon, Middle East, the boundaries, I suppose, on the kind of cusp of uh, Africa and Europe and I suppose the edge of Asia. So that's brilliant. Alvin says, big fan as well. Appreciate your insight. I uh, appreciate you saying so. Uh, I suppose I better give you some insight. Um, so if there, are, if there are questions, do ask them. If you've got points to make, do make them. I keep an eye on um, the chat but like in my real live seminars where you know I, when i i used to spend most of my time traveling around the uk mostly europe as well um delivering live training mostly project management and i always used to say just you know if you if you've got a question don't wait to the end don't even wait till i pause if you, you know wait till you think it is an appropriate time and wave your hand at me or even shout and and i'll take the question i'll deal with it because that's it's kind of what I like, you know. I I've got some notes. I'm I'm always uh, like to be well prepared, uh, so I've got some notes. Of, you know, kind of handwritten, not not uh, nothing clever. Oh, it's not going to show up properly, is it? Um, nothing clever. Uh, just some handwritten notes of things I might uh, I might mention. But you know what? I know what I know this stuff. So it's going to be interesting for you, I hope. But not. It's it's you know, uh, the questions you ask. That's the stuff that really excites me because that kind of stretches me in a new direction so uh great okay uh what have we got uh welcome again good uh brilliant right so um i think the first thing i want to say about motivating a virtual or a remote team is that the basics of motivating a team whether it's a sporting team whether it's a uh, uh uniform services whether it's um, professional services whether it's a uh, white collar uh, team or a blue collar team whether it's you know p people who are working for a living or people like me who uh, sit at desks uh, and, uh, and and computers it, the basics are the basics and they are equally as important in the virtual environment and when you're managing a remote remote team as they are when you are managing a team in the real world. And firstly, if you don't do the basics, then any of the kind of things you might add on to try to enhance their people's experience in a remote world are not going to are not going to work because you haven't got the basics right. It's just like any construction project, if you haven't got the foundation right, it doesn't matter how clever your uh, construction is above ground if you haven't got the right foundations for the conditions and for the building you're building then it won't work so get the basics right but secondly the basics are the basics for a reason they are the things that are absolutely necessary and fundamental and important and they are so important that you know if you only do the basics you will still get 80 percent the way there you'll still get a motivated team a couple of things come in uh Bom, uh, so uh, Moses says, you're right, Kenya, East Africa, equator cuts across the country, uh, the half point. Wow. So um, that's fantastic. So you don't get uh, don't get much in the way of seasonality, I guess. Uh, um, do you get pretty much 12 hour days every day? 
Fantastic. That's, I mean, makes planning easier, I suppose. Um, but then I guess you might get monsoon. Uh, so uh, there we go. Um, thank you for sharing in a relaxed environment. You bet. Uh, Bobby Jones asks, where are you based? Not sure who, Bobby, you're asking, but if you're asking me, um, I'm in the UK, southern England, um, Hampshire, if you know the United Kingdom. So what are the basics? Um, in no particular order, I suppose the first thing I would mention is that people need to feel that they are making progress. And the best way that people feel that they are making progress, that they are succeeding, is when you recognise their success. And I think there are two component, three components to that, let's say. The first is um, you need to notice when people succeed secondly they need to notice when they succeed and so for me one of the important things that we can do as project managers is put more milestones into the process because more milestones means more points of success which allow the people you're trying to motivate to recognize that they have succeeded and they've achieved something worthwhile and then they can trigger you to recognize it and the third element of that is recognition is important and so is praise. Now, there are some of us and some of you may be uh, among those people who are hugely motivated by failure. You, you, you fail at something you're trying to do. And so what do you do? You take a deep breath, you roll up your sleeves, you prepare yourself and then you dive back in with even more commi commitment and conviction. But not everyone is like that. But my feeling is that everyone, when they succeed, thinks, wow, that's great. But they only think, wow, that's great, if they notice they've succeeded. So the first thing is to put in, in place a mechanism where people notice that they've succeeded, where you notice they've succeeded, and you acknowledge that. And then you, you give them the praise that is due uh, to them for their success. And that links to another thing, I think, which is fundamental, which is feedback. Um, because not only do we, we, I think, need to feel that we are um, succeeding, but we, we need to feel we're, we're progressing, we're getting better. And feedback tells us how we're doing and gives us a chance to learn from our experience. And I've done a video about the, the relative merits, or not the relative merits, I suppose, but the right time and place for feedback which is critical and notices mistakes and corrects mistakes feedback which is neutral and non-judgmental and feedback which is positive and reinforces uh, behaviors but the the simple fact is that for people who are way below the level that they need to reach to be competent because they're still at the early stages of learning then it's fine it's, it's right to correct their mistakes but to really acknowledge and reward their successes but as they get better, you can start to ignore more and more of the little things they do wrong because they will spot them for themselves anyway. And now you're looking to reinforce the, the positive successes that they have. Um, so I think if you're going to help people to develop, then the, you need to give them opportunities to develop and therefore challenging opportunities uh, is the other big motivator. So challenge and success and development huge motivators fundamentals um and and the other i suppose aspect of our uh desire to learn and develop that you can you, you must pay attention to is not just giving people tasks and roles where they can develop themselves but giving them structured learning opportunities whether it's time to watch videos uh, on youtube I know a good project management YouTuber that I could refer you to, uh, but also formal training. Um, and of course, when we're working virtually and remotely, then we're probably going to be looking at a range of training platforms or perhaps training delivered in the way that we're delivering. I'm delivering this live stream now. The other thing, I'll, before I see if we've got any comments, is trust. You have to show trust. And it is much, much harder, I think, to trust people that you can't see all the time because they're not sitting in the same building or room as you, 
to trust people who are 100 miles away, 1,000 miles away, 10,000 miles away. And also to trust people who are different to you, who come from a different culture, who have a different set of cultural values, a different set of cultural behaviours and norms and expectations. And therefore, they will approach work in a very different way because of the nature of their culture. And I know that the world is getting smaller. I know that people from a range of different cultures working within an organisation which is headquartered and rooted in one culture will start to absorb some of the cultural values and norms and expectations of that organisation. But if you are leading a team of people from around the world, you have to, as, as a minimum, learn about their cultures so that you can set your expectations appropriately so that you can calibrate the way that you speak with them and make requests and uh, allocate work to them in a way that fits culturally um, you know just looking just looking at the range of people we've got on this live stream although there are a number of people who um, are currently in uh, may not have originally originally uh, grown up in but are currently in the united states and the uk where we have very similar cultures to one another i suppose in many ways some big differences um, that we're, we're all aware of but fundamentally business culture is very similar but then you know i look and see we've got uh, someone in Kenya, East Africa. We've got someone in uh, Cape Town. And don't know uh, where you know what your background is, but of course Cape Town is a very mixed environment in terms of cultures. Um, we've got someone from Nepal. These have very different expectations, even using English as a common language, as we're doing on this live stream. People use words in very different ways. You know, even in the UK. Uh, you can find people will use words like would, should, could, can, will in ways that have subtly different meanings. You, you can look at the dictionary and you can know exactly what those words are meant to mean. And by meant, I mean uh, expected to mean by the dictionary's compilers. But you know, if I use the word will you, I'm not being assertive or aggressive. I'm just being polite. But other people would find that as being quite pushy and quite aggressive. Uh, so perhaps I might use would you, which softens it. However, if someone uses the word can you, uh, I might, I've learned that that might just mean please do it. But it, it still hits my ears and hits my psychology as a question about my ability rather than a request to do something and so um, we have to understand those uh, different cultures and therefore show, showing trust is a really difficult thing to do but we need to do that and that comes along with the need I think to treat people as adults and I, that sounds obvious but of course when we're leading people particularly when we can't see them very often, we don't know much about them, it's very tempting to be quite prescriptive about the way people do things. But by giving people more choice, more autonomy, you are not only showing trust, but you're allowing them to develop themselves. Um, so I think those those are the basics that I would highlight. Let's see if we've got anything else coming on the chat. Uh, just one thing from Moses. Uh, oh, no, I think I've already addressed that one. So don't forget, if you've got any questions or you've got any observations about what I'm saying, um, do please put them in. And as always, you know, if you've got questions that aren't linked to the topic, um, I'll do my best to tackle them um, if I can, because that's what I enjoy doing. So we've looked at the basics, and I, I guess the next thing that I want to talk about is probably could be our could we could argue this is one of the basics too, but. I think what I've said about culture, what I've said about distance and add into that frequency of, of communication. You know, I when I worked with a team and we were all in the same office, I could just wander to their desk uh, at a moment's notice. I would bump into people at the coffee machine all the time. But when we're further apart, I think it becomes particularly important to avoid misunderstandings and that means to turn it into a positive rather than a negative of avoid being absolutely clear around expectations and definitions of things and meanings 
And because language can let us down, we have to have that dialogue which says, what aspects of what I'm saying do you not do you find confusing? What do you not understand? Um, play back what I've I've said to you in your own words, just so that we can check. So it sounds like we've we've understood one another. And I don't think that's being disrespectful. I think it's being very respectful. It's being respectful that people hear things in different ways because of their culture. And that doesn't make them wrong. It doesn't make them stupid. If they didn't understand you the way that you intended them to understand you, it just means they're bringing a whole set of other expectations and understandings. And that's assuming that their first lang that their English, if you're communicating in English, is as good as your English. Uh, you know, if you are both first lang if you both share the same first language, then you're you're off and running and got a really good chance of communicating easily. But if you one of the things that surprised me surprised me was I found out that people who speak English as a business language and have other first languages tend to communicate with each other more effectively than they can communicate with someone who has English as a first language. Um, which because they because I guess they're they're used to the same uh, confusions. So that's interesting. So if any of you in the call are listening to me in a language which isn't your first language or are used to working in a lang in another language from your second first language, I'd be fascinated to hear because I have never had to work um, in any language other than English and I don't speak fluently uh, to a good business uh, level any language other than English. I've worked in Germany uh, amongst people who speak fantastic English and I've worked in Holland uh, amongst a group of people who speak fantastic English. And I've worked in the United States amongst a group of people who speak American English. <laughs> but I have never had to get by in a language other than my own. And so um, I'd be interested in your um, experiences. Uh, Moses says, discuss communication across generations and its place in motivating a virtual team. That's a, that's a really good one. Um, I should, maybe I could be cheeky and ask people what uh, in what generations you identify yourself in. I think the there is a a a real issue here that has, there has always been a division uh, between the generations. For as long as we have recorded history, we find young people being frustrated with aspects of the old, what the older generations do. But I think what we're seeing now is that our societies are changing faster than ever before because of the rate at which technology has been facilitating those changes. And that means that people are growing up with technologies which are alien to earlier generations. Well, not alien, but earlier generations are adapting to those technologies, whereas the younger generations are adopting them as part of their way of being. You know, there was the phrase a while ago, digital natives, young people who live in the digital world they don't see the digital world as an alternative to their day-to-day -day world they live in the digital world i think my daughter is a digital native and i'm you know i am tremendously comfortable with the medium we're using now I, i'm tremendously comfortable with video and video editing and uh, editing with graphics software and using email and stuff my daughter actually isn't big on email she's she's too young it's yeah. to her email is i guess like fax is to me um it's a technology uh which had its peak when i was young <laughs> and, and and i mean the, the the age difference is a bit different but um you know i fax lasted for a few years of my working career and then disappeared and was replaced by email my daughter at the age of 12 sees email as a kind of secondary mechanism for communicating so what does that mean about communicating across generations it's a tough one because i don't have any direct workplace experience that is current my workplace experience uh is now getting on for 20 years out of date um and most of the people i train i guess are in their 30s 40s I suppose. So do I do I have a really uh, strong point of view that I can share? I think as with all motivation, when you get past the basics, it's understanding what motivates people and playing to that 
And it has always been the case that each individual has their own motivators. And some of those they share with a a demographic chunk with whom they identify. And they might share some of their motivators with other people of their age, some of their motivators with other people of their gender, some of their motivators with other people of their culture. Um, so my sense is that the younger generation far more that you know i was one of the most pushy people of my working generation uh, in my own workplace in terms of wanting to do things my way and not being keen to be subordinate i think probably now i would be seen as quite compliant compared to the the average certainly in the uk and and again you know i i wouldn't want to assume that generational differences operate in the same way in every culture. Um, it may be that in Connecticut, generational differences aren't that stunningly uh, different to, the, to how they operate in the UK, but maybe in Nepal, maybe in Cape Town, maybe in Nairobi, they, they work differently just because their the generational differences are embedded within different cultures. But it has always been the case that younger generations have wanted to rebel, have wanted to do their own thing. It's why the human species is not uh, an African species like lions and giraffe. You don't find lions and giraffe around the world. You find them in Africa um, and in parts of certain parts of Africa, sub-Saharan Africa. Why do you find human beings around the whole world? Because our brains are wired, particularly those of men, young men, that at around about the age of 16, we start wanting to disobey and explore the world for ourselves and go our own way. And so young men would leave the village and look for their own kind of discoveries and their own village to set up so they could be in control of their future. And then they would come back and get the young women who didn't originally come with them so that they would make... And that allowed the human species to spread around the globe in... A, you know, relatively short amount of time. I think it was like hundreds of thousands of years, not even millions of years, for the human species to travel the whole globe uh, and to be everywhere. The last two places that the human species colonised, and I think the only two species, two places that were colonised in uh, a time of written history, are New Zealand and Iceland. Anyone on the call from New Zealand or Iceland? Uh, because your predecessors um, came relatively late. I think New Zealand was colonised by the people who we now refer to as Maori, I think, um, in the, what, 14th, 13th century. And Iceland was first colonised by people from uh, Scandinavian countries around, I think, the 9th century, 8th, 9th, 8th, 9th, 10th centuries AD, uh, or Common Era. So um, I think my answer, Moses, <laughs> long rambling answer to your uh, straightforward question, Moses, is that... Um, we need to recognise the desire to do things our own way, and the expect and the increasing and, it, and possibly an increased over, over when I was young, maybe when you were young, maybe you are young, uh, um, and, in, and an increasing expectation that they will be allowed to do their own thing um, and find their own way to do things and respect them, treat them as adults, give them autonomy, give them choice, set whatever constraints you absolutely have to set, um, but. Only the constraints you have to set would be my advice. Ah, t -Stew just arrived. Uh, arrived from where, t uh, where, where, where are you based at the moment? Um, anyway, let's move on. Um, because uh, I've talked about getting the basics right. And I've talked about the importance of being clear about expectations to avoid misunderstanding. And I think there's one other thing I think that kind of goes in with that avoiding misunderstanding thing, which is... Clearly, if you're going to motivate people, you need to radiate optimism and you need to encourage optimism. But um, there's a, a French novel called uh, Candide by Voltaire, uh, which gives us the word Panglossian. Dr. Pangloss in Voltaire was always optimistic about everything. Everything that happens was the best thing that could possibly have happened. Now, the reality of most projects is that things go wrong and you would be bonkers to say, wow, this is fantastic. This is great. We could be hugely enthusiastic and hugely optimistic about everything. And that's not what I mean. That Not that kind of glass half full optimism that says no matter how bad things are, everything's great. Um, what I'm talking about here is balancing 
absolute realism, being absolutely clear with your team what the real situation is, because they can't make sensible, sound, wise judgments and decisions. You're giving them autonomy and you want them to make good decisions, but they can't make good decisions unless you are absolutely clear about the real situation with them. But you need to remain optimistic. And for me, that's about having confidence that there are things that you and the team together can control and working with the team to identify what those are. Because I think one of the biggest motivators is back to this kind of what psychologists will call a sense of agency, a sense that we are an agent in our world and can therefore affect it. And the fatalistic approach that says, oh, God, everything's gone wrong. There's nothing we can do is the exact opposite of what I'm advocating. Everything may have gone wrong, but you're a group of professionals. You're an intelligent group of people, hopefully from a range of different backgrounds and uh, and histories so you can deploy so much knowledge so much expertise and wisdom um, and giving your team uh, the most realistic assessment of the situation gathering it, their perceptions from it and then working the problem that's what i mean about optimism oh there's been a whole slew of uh comments coming so i'm just going to kind of peer at them you'll notice i lean towards the screen that's because i haven't figured out how to change the size of the comments on my uh, relatively small monitor that i'm using uh underneath the camera so uh, bear with me just a moment while i squint away at the screen so atistu uh, is leading our game a game development team of about seven Notice that when we see each other work, we trust that the project is going forward and that others take responsibility. We're working without money. Motivation is the most important thing. We're working without money. Motivation is the most important thing for us. I'm going to pause and go back to Tistu's first comment. When we see each other, we're caught, we trust the project is going forward and that others take responsibility. I think the may not be an implication that you intended to make, but the inference that I would draw from that, Tistu, is that maybe when you're not watching what other people are doing doubts start to nag at you that maybe other people aren't being as diligent as you are because that would be a very kind of common thing um and clearly when you say you're working without money and motivation is an important thing for us i'm guessing they're in a kind of startup sort of uh, uh, arena uh, we have two to three people who don't want to use video or sound so we don't know what they do until the Till they post something yes, I think you meant um, yeah so there we are I, I kind of should have read ahead yeah so out of sight out of trust um, I I find it really worrying that people don't want to po use use her voice or sound but I recognize that that's the reality of some for some people um, they don't feel comfortable um, speaking out they don't feel comfortable using uh um video um what i would suggest is you have a one-to-one -one conversation with those people if you're if you're a team leader or even if you're not actually maybe you can still um get on a call with them and encourage them in group meetings to use one or other of sound so uh or video um don't make it too difficult for them i'm part of a, a group where there were people at the start when i first started in the group who never turned on their camera and only chatted in the chat but didn't speak out um, as they get got more familiar with the group for whatever their own personal reasons were they gradually started to engage at a higher level so um all is not lost. Be welcoming to them. Be encouraging to them. Do not hector them or browbeat them for what they're doing. Um, unless, you know, you want to set a policy, in which case you don't hector or browbeat. You just say that's the rule. Um, but maybe on a one on one basis, they will be better at using the camera and that will perhaps give them the chance to feel more comfortable with it. Uh, make sure um, one of the things I had planned to say is, you know, the importance of the workspace when you are uh, working virtually. If if you're working virtually from a different office, then that's fine. You've got all the equipment you need. You've got all the you know this. But if if you're working from home, some people are not confident to show their home background, or they don't. Have, they have a lot of noise. 
as an organization, and I know it's difficult if you're in a startup, but invest some money, take an interest in people's setups uh, and give people allowances. I think uh, Automatic, the people who uh, developed the WordPress infrastructure, um, they give all of their home workers uh, an allowance of $2,000 to spend on equipment to make their home working environment as productive as possible. Some people will buy ergonomic chairs, others will buy better webcams or better microphones. You know, your issue is certainly clearly about uh, use of virtual conferencing technology. So perhaps look at whether they've got concerns over whether they can blank their background. Um, maybe you could give some money for them to have a kind of pop-up screen. And those very simple pop-up screens. That way they could kind of screen themselves from uh, prying eyes looking into their personal lives. Uh, maybe they're a bit concerned about the quality of the sound, so you could invest perhaps a small amount of money in a microphone. I mean, you know, these things are, are not super cheap, but they're not super expensive. You know, I've got a mid-range microphone. This isn't the cheapest cheap. Uh, here it is. It's not the cheapest of the cheap, and it's not the most expensive of the most expensive by any means. I think this was about 40, 50 UK pounds. So we're talking, what, about 60, 70 dollars. Um, you can get cheaper and that will still be very good. Add to that a boom arm. Uh, this is, a, again, a mid-range one, not the cheapest. But I mean, I reckon you could get a good, a good enough microphone and a boom arm and a cable for probably 60, 70 dollars all in. Um, and again, webcams are not expensive. Um, you can get a decent one. So, you know, look at investing in some kit to help themselves there, help them feel uh, more able to engage. Um, Nicholas just arrived. Uh, Nicholas from Montreal, Quebec. Uh, a regular, yeah, I recognize your, uh, I recognize the, the little kind of icon um, there. Uh, so that's that's kind of filled out the uh, countries in North America now. We've got, so, we've got people from the United States and from Canada. Um, Right, not all the cultures, I suspect, but there we go. Um, so, Andre, Andre Cristiano, uh, I think this is interesting on team dynamics because when we're together, I see those basics is great. Then there is the time that each individual needs to perform on their own, and that's self motivation. Yes. So, we we kind of charge up our motivation when we're together, when we're with people who are inspiring um, and inspirational. And then uh, we take that and we then have to, have to use that to motivate ourselves. Recognise, by the way, there are fundamentally in, in one dimension, there are two broad types of people. There are those who get a big charge of energy and enthusiasm and motivation and commitment from being with other people. And then they use that when they're working on their own, if they have to work on their own, uh, that they use that charge to to propel them forwards, kind of a bit like a electric vehicle I suppose there are other people who find it really difficult uh, emotionally to spend too much time with a large group of people so what they will do is they will find that as they're when they're when they're engaged and engaging with a group of people maybe this is part of the the issue excuse me that uh, Tistu uh, was talking about but maybe those two people they find it you know, it takes it's hard work being with another group of people, so it's a bit easier. Just like, you know, some of us when we're talking to someone and we need to think, we kind of avert our gaze because it's just too hard to to keep our eyes on on people. They they find it difficult. It 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 drains their energy being with people. It takes a lot of energy and a lot of work to stay alert, to stay engaged, and to stay to project that confidence. And so, and actually, they do their best work when they're on their own because, uh, you know, and come um, but on their own is when they recharge their batteries and they can do good work. And maybe they at least do those those people are there. Um, so yeah, there are this uh, there is this self motivation thing, um, which you have to. I guess this virtual motivation is really about charging up people's self-motivation for those people who need it. Uh, good. Uh, Tistu from Sweden. Excellent. So that's someone else from Europe as a continent, but uh, Scandinavia, so a distinct part of Europe. I've never been to Sweden. Would love to go. Worked in, uh, worked in Norway for a short while, which uh, I really enjoyed and got a huge respect for Scandinavian uh 
sense of how to cope with weather. Um, when we get snow in the UK, it stops everything. Uh, certainly, I'm guessing exactly the same in Sweden, but uh, in, in Norway, when they got snow, that's just the weather, and you get on with it. Um, uh, so, uh, so Andre, any thoughts? Uh, team dynamics when we're together, basics. Yeah, uh, I, th- I think I've kind of answered it, but if you've got a more specific question to ask Andre, do um, do clarify and or ask a follow-up question. Very happy to take that. Ah, Rick. Rick Stratton, any advice to support a remote virtual team member who appears distracted due to the anxiety around the pandemic and a related uncertainty? Well, I think the first thing I would say is spend time listening to them. Um, the problem with the pandemic for most of us is and has been that there's nothing much we can do as individuals about it. We can we can certainly choose our behaviours and uh, make choices around our private lives, but at the end of the day, we're not in control of the pandemic. Even our governments aren't in control of the pandemic, and they've got more control than the rest of us. Um, and I guess in some countries that's a good thing, and in others it's not such a good thing. Um, but when we get anxious, I think one of the things we need to do is to, to vent that anxiety. And so one of the best things you can do is, is give that colleague a, a good listening to. Um, take time out uh, to, to listen to them. Find out what their anxieties are and those distractions are. And then look out for opportunities to relieve some of those distractions or aid with them. And I'm not looking for you to become some kind of rescuer that takes away their their agency but for example if one of their anxieties is that uh they've got let's just take an example which i have absolutely no sense that this might be particularly what's going on but let's take as an example their anxiety stems from the fact that someone in their household uh has poor health and is therefore susceptible to covid and if they got covid they would become very ill seriously ill and let's say that this colleague is distracted because they are concerned that they're going to be expected to return to work uh, soon. And that's going to mean commuting and meeting more people. And therefore, that will increase their risk uh, of bringing uh, infection into the household. If you found that out, then I hope you would be able to find some some ways to help them with that by perhaps requiring less travel, perhaps um providing them with the funds for high quality um higher quality masks and and whatever whatever arrangements you can find to help relieve that distraction um you should do this is one of the things that we do as as colleagues as leaders as employers is to help our our teams to be at their best um so all I can, I, without knowing what the anxiety is, I mean, you can you can get into, you know, not counsellor mode, but minor kind of counsellor mode by asking them some questions and helping them to see that there are, this is a kind of classic model, that there are two zones. There's a zone of control. There are things that uh, you can control in our, your life. Uh, and which therefore you should be concerned about to to optimize. For example, you control you can control some of your own choices. You can control uh, some of the ways you do things and that, that. But then there are other things which will affect you, but you have no control over. And worrying about those, being anxious about those things, is futile. Now, it's human nature, but it is futile. Therefore, direct them to try to expand their zone of control by learning more about the situation and therefore perhaps having a slightly larger area where they can make choices. Now that's, that is the, the conversation I'd want to have with them once I understood more about their situation, about you know, what is within their control, what do they believe is within their control what might be within their control that they haven't yet identified as being within their control. Um, Thoughts about building confidence in interns who are shy? 
Well, first thing, first thing I do is get them to watch <laughs> um, the video that I came out today uh, on the channel, which was about imposter syndrome, because that will be one of the things that uh, uh, will hit confidence, uh, for, particularly for young people. But imposter syndrome hits us uh, all the way up to our uh, 80s, 90s. <laughs> century um you know we i don't think you ever completely grow out of imposter syndrome uh, unless you're somewhat psychopathic um in nature psychopaths i don't think get imposter syndrome um but i think um building confidence in inter interns who are shy so they're building confidence at work is about giving people things that they can do and succeed in and recognizing their success uh limiting the scope of what you're asking people to do so that they the mistakes they make are ones they can cope with but the shyness thing um, is about i think the best thing you can do to help people who are shy is to put them in situations which are not going to challenge their shyness much you know if they've got this boundary where they feel safe their perception is anywhere outside the boundary they are para para petrified what you need to do is to move them very slightly outside their boundary and acknowledge their successes and say, that went well. I think that person was really impressed by you. And that way you can ease them out would be my approach. Um, uh, so... Uh, Andre says, yeah, you already answered it, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, it was divided because the chat had max characters. Yeah, it wasn't. It was just wanting to make sure I'd really understood because um, I can't remember where you're from if you've said, uh, but it maybe you used shorthand or maybe English isn't your first language. Andre Cristiano. I could guess, but I'm not going to. Uh, um Good. Uh, and Andre also says the elaboration really triggered my thinking to explore. Wonderful. Great. Thank you, uh, Rick. Good suggestion. Good. How are we doing time wise? Um, I've stopped saying these are going to be an hour. They'll be how, however long they are. I, I will stop when I've done two things. One is um, uh, talked about all the things that I've thought of to talk about. Um, uh, and two, uh, when there's no more questions uh, that anyone wants me to answer or comments they want to make. Um, the next thing I thought would be worth mentioning is that uh, if you want to motivate a virtual team, the next thing you can try is to do as much as possible to appropriately try to recreate a sense of proximity. And the first element of that is to look at where you use synchronous and asynchronous communication. So synchronous communication is communication that is as close as possible in real time. I say hello to you and you reply hello back. Um, so obviously video calls, telephone, are synchronous communication. So is instant messaging if it's instant messaging. So, uh, for example, uh, I guess the most commonly uh, used is Slack. Slack is a, a form of synchronous communication when both people are online and engaged. But it becomes asynchronous when I send you a message, ping, and you don't get it till tomorrow. Email is asynchronous communication. And the reason, one of the reasons why it's such a poor form of communication is because when I send a message in the back of my mind I'm thinking of it as synchronous communication uh, because if you haven't replied in five minutes I think you know you're shirking you're not you're not responding to my email the fact is you might be not responding to my email because you are doing everything but shirking because you are working hard on something different and you've got your email closed which in time management terms is exactly the right thing to do so um and I'm not saying there is no place for asynchronous communication because, let's face it, when we're working in an office together, we will sometimes use asynchronous communication. But think about the choices that you are making. Be mindful and look to make as much use as you can of the modes of synchronous communication that you have. Uh, rather than send someone an email, um, pick up the telephone. Uh, if you are in an environment where you've got a... Uh, on-demand video call system. I think Teams supports it. You can just ping someone and say, are you there? Can we have a chat? That's great. But if you can't do that, then the next best thing is to schedule frequent check-ins, particularly if you are a team leader, frequent check-ins with the people you lead. Um, and 
don't set one rule that suits you. Look for the rules or not rules that suit each of your people. If one of your people likes uh, uh, to fit it in around various different requirements and therefore perhaps Wednesday afternoon and then next week perhaps Tuesday morning and, and again and perhaps on, on Friday around lunchtime might suit them. But there are other people who will say, Wednesday morning every week, that's perfect for me. So for each person, come up with a schedule that works for them. It needs to work for you as well. I'm not saying your time isn't precious. But remember, when you are a manager or a leader, your job is to manage or lead. Everything else that you do is subsidiary to your primary role as leader or manager. And therefore, speaking to people is leadership, it's management. Uh, and therefore, it is more important than clearing your emails or writing your report you fit that in around it that's your job your job as a manager is to fit everything around managing people your job as a leader is to fit everything around leading people your job as a project manager is to fit everything around managing the project and how do we manage the project by managing the people on the project so synchronous uh, more synchronous communication more uh, frequent check-ins and then building social interaction i think i mentioned this at the start you know if you allow if you let's say you're having a group teams or zoom call or blue jeans or whatever you use webex you're having a group call don't call the call, call the meeting to order at the start right at the beginning give people time to chat so perhaps if you want to start at 9 a.m say to people where the, the call starts at uh, 10 to 9 join the call have a chat with people catch up bit of banter and then around nine o'clock you say we're going to start in a couple of minutes uh, so finish your conversations if you need to start step out for a moment to make yourself comfortable get a last glass of water do that now because we're going to start in a couple of minutes and there are more and more technology coming now i noticed that uh, my zoom uh, app upgraded itself the other day and there are apps that you can load into zoom so if there is an app that allows you to load a timer say meeting starts in five minutes then load it and allow people to chat while that little five minute thing is ticking away now i am conducting this live stream using live streaming software which allows me uh, to put up a countdown i can create as many countdowns as i like of whatever format i like I'm not gonna do one now but if it's not available in your software now then there are two things one if you are in control to a degree of the software you use, then select software that makes it easy to do the things that you want to do to manage and lead your team well and to motivate your people. But if you're not in control of the software because you're part of a big organization uh, that uh, uses Microsoft or uses WebEx or whatever, then look for the ways to adapt it. You know, as, a, as an absolute minimum, look, here we are. I've got a clock in the corner of the uh, live stream. Using the highest of high technology, um, I can do that. Now, if I spent a few minutes more thinking about it, I could probably arrange to have this visible without a light shining on it um, on the back shelf. And I could say, there's the clock, there's the countdown. And I could probably buy a kitchen timer with a big display. And that kitchen timer, I could be set with a countdown on it. So you don't need high tech apps. So just adapt your environment and your process to do what is right, rather than try to do the best you can with the apps you've got. Look to bootstrap the best things. So, um, and by the way, new people will join your team. People's life situations will change. How much do you know about the new people on your team? How much do you know about the changes in people's life situations who are on your team? You know, are you chatting with people informally and finding out? There's a, there's a marvellous company in the UK uh, called Timson. I um, can't remember who it was. It was from, uh, from the Midlands, uh, from Birmingham. But we had someone on the call from Birmingham. So uh, Azuma, there you are. You will have heard of Timson. Uh, Timson are all over the UK. It's, a, it's not a franchise business, but it, it feels like a franchise business in the sense that there's shops all over the UK. Um, uh, and they are little shops and they, they, they repair shoes, they repair watches, uh, they cut keys, they do all those sorts of things. I'm sure every country has uh, businesses like that. Some are big businesses that are uh, uh, franchised around the country or, or have lots of uh, individuals. Uh, other countries, it'll be, you know, small family businesses but the thing about Timson's 
is that uh, they are I really prioritize the relationship between their senior managers and their managers and the staff and senior managers regional managers are expected to know and are I think twice a year tested upon their knowledge of the personalities and the people that work for them so you know the, the head office will say right come in it's test day um, in your in your Redditch branch uh, there are three people working there who are they Great. So John works there. Um, what football team does John support? And the the senior managers will be expected to know these answers. The regional managers will be expected to know these answers because they value getting to know their teams. And, and I think you should. If you're running a project team, get to know your people because that way you can head off some of the anxieties that they might have. If you know that Jackie has just announced that her partner is pregnant and that they're going to want... Uh, then you can actually plan for that. You can actually talk to her about, you know, uh, parental leave. You can talk to her about, you know, time at work and things like that proactively rather than her worrying what you're going to say when you find out that she's got a female partner, which might be a surprise to you, uh, and that her partner is, is pregnant. So be get to know your people, stay in touch with them, build relationships with them. Um, Create a virtual water cooler. Create a, a, a system where people can, uh, anyone who, you know, perhaps set up a Zoom or a team meeting, Teams meeting um, at 11.30 every day that anyone can join and chat about anything for half an hour. Talk shop, talk whatever, uh, it's there. Sometimes you'll pop in, sometimes you won't. And, and just let people do that. See if it works for the culture of your team. Think about events and particularly think about celebration. I talked at the beginning of the live stream about the importance of recognition and praise as basic motivators. But what comes after recognizing that someone's done well and praising them for it, it's celebrating their successes, celebrating the team's successes. So look for opportunities to do that. Let's see if we've got uh, any more uh, comments. Uh, good afternoon from Max. Good afternoon, Max. Uh, uh, Azuma says yes visit Timson from time to time don't we all um, <laughs> yeah uh, uh, but yes so uh, Max do tell us where you are do ask any questions you've got that's the rules of the road uh, is that you can ask anything you like and uh, we like it to hear where people are from but we don't require you to tell us if it's uh, not something you want to share uh, another thought says Andre I guess self-motivation in virtual meeting world will be another big topic on its own. Yeah, I mean, we can only really approach self-motivation from, from, from the point of view of how do we motivate ourselves? Because we can't self-motivate other people. Um, we can just kind of charge up their motivation as we, as we talked about. But um, yeah, how do we get ourselves self-motivated? I think you're right, it is another topic. Um, but... My tip, having made lots and lots of videos, is just look straight into the lens as often as, as much as you can uh, and treat it like a face. If you are one of those people who's confident looking at someone in the eye, then that's the eye. There it is. If, on the other hand, you're not someone who's confident looking at people in the eye, then you don't have to worry because you're just looking at a lens which is inanimate and it can't possibly blink, uh, which is a bit intimidating. But uh, yeah. Um, Self-motivation um, in, in a virtual meeting help people with their self-motivation. Just something I should have said earlier um, uh, with Kistu as well is when you ask a question of a group, you know, as I do in the live stream, I can say, you know, what are your questions? And anyone who has a question can answer. If you're in a group of seven and you're all working together, that's only one way you can do it. It would be inappropriate of me to say, pick on T-Stew and say, what other question do you have, T-Stew? We'll sit and wait till you give us an answer. But it's perfectly appropriate in a team meeting to say, T-Stew, uh, what are your thoughts about the next step in the project? And to keep looking at the screen until T-Stew replies. Now, it's okay for T-Stew to say, I haven't given that any thought or... Uh, I've got nothing to add to what other people have said. But in a real meeting, I will sometimes do a round robin and I will turn to the next person in the list, ask them for their point of view, for their opinion, for their recommendation, for their observations, whatever we're talking about, and actually 
go round everybody. That makes sure that the shy people are heard by everyone and it also brings them to the to the front and, and get engages them. So that's a good tip. Uh, what else have we got here? Uh, Patrick, one of the keys, I believe, is to trust the team members, absolutely, and communicate that to them. Yeah, it's not enough to trust people. If you want to motivate them, they've got to know you trust them. Uh, otherwise, they will just make up stories in their mind. Mike doesn't talk to me. It's because he doesn't trust me. Whereas in my mind, I'm thinking, I won't bother you because I trust you to get on with it. So you know, just recognize that people make up stories in their minds. Uh, so Patrick goes on to say, it helps set a level of expectation that they feel they need to meet. And you can reinforce that with metrics. Yeah, um, I guess I... <laughs> There is a risk that enforcing people to meet expectations with metrics is kind of communicating the message, I don't trust you, that's why I'm imposing metrics on you. Uh, so be careful with that, Patrick. But the way I would sell metrics is metrics mean that as soon as we hit them, we celebrate and as a team. Uh, and we celebrate the achievement of the team. We celebrate the achievement of the individuals that have hit the met metrics. Um, it, there's nothing inappropriate about using metrics. Um, but just be aware that uh, imposing metrics can look like a I don't trust you're going to do it, so we're going to check on you. Um, so that's just a little word of caution there. But as with everything in life, the answer is balance. I'm not saying synchronous communication is right or asynchronous communication is right. It's balance. Predictive, adaptive project management. The answer is balance. And of course, the balance that is right for a situation will be different to the balance that is right for a other situation. I did kind of talk a bit about recreating a sense of proximity, but there are some things that actually work well with distance. The distance is fine for personal notes. And a personal note to somebody to thank them, an email popping up in your email in your inbox that doesn't ask you to reply, doesn't ask you to do something, doesn't ask you to think about something, doesn't ask you to comment on something, just says, I noticed what you did and it was really good and I just wanted to say that's fantastic. It's just magic. I sometimes get them from people. There's, there's, there's a couple of people in this, um, in this live stream who have sent me personal notes by email to comment on something I've done or to thank me for something I've done and it just it just it just feels wonderful when I receive them and that will be the same for your people but if you want to up the ante pick up oh the cat has decided it's time to uh, join the live stream uh just get a bit distracted there's gonna be a tail probably in front of the camera in a moment um so you know if you want to up the ante from email then pick up a piece of paper and a pen write them a letter and put it in the post these days receiving a handwritten note is you know the ultimate of someone saying i wanted to take some time to express my gratitude for what you did or my admiration for what you did or whatever oh here he comes uh they say cat videos get more views so uh in my bid uh, by the way, don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you're not subscribed. Don't forget to uh, put a like because it really helps the YouTube algorithm to uh, to know who to send this to. Um, but now maybe I'll get the cat contingent as well. That uh, this is this is my cat Misty. Um, <laughs> uh, Misty uh, is a kind of uh, virtual presence because he spends most of the time sleeping. Um, I trust that uh, once or twice a day he'll go out and uh, chase down local wildlife um, but yeah anyway um, the other thing you can do with distance uh, as well possibly even better than you can do in real world is to increase um, autonomy um, give people a chance to work on their own to as great an extent as you can but at the same time keep an open door an open Zoom door, an open Teams door, an open WebEx door, an open Blue Jeans door, whatever. That is to say, make it clear to your team that if, if at any time they want to speak with you, all they need to do is ping you with whatever mechanism uh, uh, is most appropriate to your situation, whether it's a, uh, a Slack message or maybe an email or maybe it's a, a text message on your phone to say, I like a chat. And, you know, the, the default, your default response is, 
yep, let's let's get on let's get on a call straight away, or let's get on a call in half an hour's time. Not expecting your default to be, let's arrange something for next week. Clearly, there were times when you're not going to be able to jump on a call straight away or in the next half hour. That's fine. But if the default is your door is open, um, that means that you can safely or to a you know, greater extent, you can safely um, delegate more autonomy. The other thing is to encourage a routine, um, but a routine that works with the distance. And of course, you know, some of the people on this call uh, for you, it's early in the morning. Um, those particularly those on the west coast of the United States, west coast of Canada, um, you know, it's early morning. I mean, it's not ridiculously early. It's not silly early. Um, I don't think we've got anyone from Hawaii I'm not sure what time it is in Hawaii, whether it's late, very, very late on uh, on Tuesday or very, very early on Tuesday in Hawaii, but I uh, can't remember where, where it is in the date line. But um, there are also, there's also at least one person from Nepal, so I'm guessing it's late night for you. Uh, it's coming around midnight in Nepal, I would guess. Um, <sighs> cats. Gotta love them. Um, so figure out a routine that works for you and for them. Uh, both in terms of the, the, the work that they're doing and the communication you have. And uh, let's just check any uh, any other things. Uh, we've got a big thumbs up from Andre, but nothing, no other questions. So the last thing I think is important is to think about hygiene factors. And I've, I've talked a bit about that, but take an interest in people's environment. And, you know, if they are working in another office, Take an interest in what's going on in the office and the facilities they've got. Do what you can to ensure that they've got the right facilities. If they are working from home or they are having to work from um, an accommodation office of some sort, then make sure that they have and are able to acquire the best tools for the job. It's, it's very easy for people, particularly in affluent countries, working for large organizations where people are well paid to assume that everyone has space they can work in, can afford uh, a decent setup in their room. But that is not going to be the case for all of your team members. Or it may not be the case. So look at what you can do to subsidize their acquisition of equipment they need to work well. Make sure that they've got a comfortable and can afford to buy a comfortable chair to sit in if they're going to be working uh, in a chair uh, for six, seven hours a day. Um, and that, if that means requisitioning the money to pay for them, uh, to pay for you know, to reimburse them for buying a chair, or even to give them the money in advance so they can go and buy a chair, do it. You will get a better colleague as a result because they'll be able to work for longer hours more comfortably and they won't be worried about their back um acquire the best tools collaboration tools you can um, i know big companies particularly impose restrictions on which tools you use but you know speak to the it department make a business case for the tools you need to lead your team well and I think the last thing in terms of hygiene factors is be very clear. Again, balance is the, the, the important concept here uh, about the, the, the right balance between the need for process, procedure, policy to be met. You know, there are cases where you things have to be done in a certain way and they have to be done right. Um, and it matters. Oh, shush. I'm going to have to put you down. Uh, but there are other times like now when you've got a cat in your arms where informality is perfectly fine you know i'm not going to be any less informative because there's a cat sitting on me having a wash um so you don't need you don't need to set a policy which says you can't have a pet in the room when you're on a, a live stream or on a zoom call or a teams call so think about how much you can relax formality. It does it matter what people are wearing within certain boundaries, obviously. But, you know, I certainly in the UK, I've got a sense that office workers who would have expected to go to the office wearing a suit and tie certainly do not wear a suit and tie when they're on Zoom calls. Uh, so what works for you as an organisation, what works for your people, 
you know, what rules are you assuming are important, but when you actually think about them, are at best not necessary and at worst just plain silly in the context. I've seen some movements on the chats. Let's see what we've got here. Uh, so Nicholas says, talking about proximity, uh, we talked about the virtual water cooler. Uh, one thing I've heard and agree with is we have to remember that meetings are not only useful for advancing the work, um, it's also important for maintaining relationships in the team. Absolutely. So um, on my other channel, Management Courses, um, I have... I have a series of full management training courses. Um, each one is a YouTube playlist, completely free. One of those is on meetings. There's also one on Teams, by the way, and there's also one on motivation. Uh, and uh, we're currently working our way through the end of the Teams one. That comes out, I think, every Tuesday. The last few Teams ones are coming out over the next month or so. Uh, currently on Thursdays, uh, organisations uh, and the nature of organisations is our topic. Uh, but the motivation one is finished, the meetings one is finished, and we're starting up with feedback and with marketing in the autumn. But anyway, if you go to the Teams one, one of those Teams ones talks about different types of meetings. Sorry, if you go to the meetings playlist and the meetings course, one of the bit, one of them talks about the, the five types of conversations we have in meetings. And one of those types of conversations is a meet or a meeting. One of those types of meetings is a meeting for conversation. Sorry. One of those types of meetings is a meeting where we have a conversation for relationships. Conversations for relationships are about two things. One is sharing information and the other is enhancing the relationships that we've got. So Nicholas is absolutely uh, spot on with that. So we should keep the meeting, even if we have uh, no work to advance. So, Nicholas, yes, if the meeting genuinely does advance the relationships, if you remember that relationships are important and you reformat the meeting to build the relationships, to share information, to possibly even to chat, then that's great. But there is another type of meeting, which is a conversation for ritual. So there are five types. Uh, four of those types are really useful. And meetings for relation, conversation for relationships is one of them. But conversation for ritual is the type of meeting which is not useful at all because it's the kind of meeting we have because we have the meeting. And we've all been to them. We go along to the meeting, we learn nothing, we progress nothing, we decide nothing, we have no new ideas, we just have the meeting because we always have the meeting. It's a ritual. Those are the kind of meetings that waste people's time, leave people jaded. We need to either repurpose those meetings to either be a meeting uh, that is a conversation for relationship or a conversation for opportunity or a conversation for possibility or a conversation for action. Because if all it is is a ritual, then it is a waste of people's time. Um, so uh, do have a look at that, uh, anyone who's interested in that. Let's finish uh, Nicholas's comment, though. He said, therefore, we should keep meetings even if we have no work to advance. I agree. If we, if we uh, specifically have a meeting that progresses relationships, that's good. Because at least we have an opportunity to maintain relationships. Yep. If all the team has gone virtual and there are no real water cooler conversations anymore. Exactly. That's exactly right. Have a water cooler meeting. Have a water cooler Zoom call or a water cooler Teams call. Give it a clever name. Find someone on the team who's you know, good at naming things and come up with a clever name for it because that's exactly right. Uh -huh. Patrick agrees. Um, Patrick, have to step away for a few minutes. Mike, hopefully catch the tail end or catch you everywhere else. Absolutely. Uh, if you've already stepped away, sorry to have missed you, but uh, if you're just about to go, see you. Patrick, I think, comes to pretty much everything. Uh, so great to see him there. Um, well, we are pretty much. Uh, I mean, I've, I've kind of run out of things that I kind of prepared. I try to prepare around about an hour's worth, uh, allowing for some chat and stuff. And we seem to be there. It's uh, 20 minutes past the hour, so we've been going for uh, 80 minutes. Um, any other questions or observations, um, please do uh, chime, up, chime in. Again, doesn't have to bet anything. A uh, little while well, maybe some people are chatting, just remind you that this is now on my desk. Um, I have, I wouldn't say I've read it cover to cover every single word, but I've had a pretty thorough review of it. Monday, 
uh, first thing in the morning UK time. So uh, uh, before the Americans and uh, South Americans and North Americans get up, um, uh, but sort of mid morning, I guess, for the Nepalese and the Indian uh, contingents and thing. Uh, my review of this document will go live on the website. Um, so that's onlinepmcourses.com. Uh, look under articles and you'll find that. Um, and it's more than a review. I describe what's in it. Um, I do give my opinion. Um, and, you know, one of the questions I get asked is, Mike, are you a member of the PMI? No, I'm not. Um, and, and the reason is because I feel like if I were a member, I couldn't be trenchant in my criticism if I disagreed with anything they do. So you know, I have some critiques of this, but not many in the grand scheme of things. I think it's a really good document. And the next live stream, I'm just going to call up my calendar, actually, uh, and find out what is the date of the first Tuesday in September. Come on. Where's my mouse? I can't see my mouse pointer. There we are. Uh, so the first Tuesday in September uh, will be the 7th, I think. Yup. The 7th of September, so same time on the 7th of September, first Tuesday, uh, we will have a live stream and we will be talking uh, Pinbok Guide 7th edition. Um, and I'll talk, I'll, I'll, you know, plan to tell you a bit about what I think is in it that is worth uh, being aware of, worth noting. Um, for those of you who are on a slim budget, um, there are, in fact, ways that you can access some of the most interesting information uh, in summary form uh, at no cost. So I'll be uh, telling you about that um, uh, and we'll be discussing it. So anyone who has a copy or is planning to get a copy, do uh, familiarize yourself with it as much as you have time uh, for uh, beforehand so that you can contribute to the conversation. There is, of course, a video uh, on the channel. Um, where I have a conversation with Nada Rad. Nada was one of the 14 core team members, 12 core team members and plus two um, team leaders who did the primary development on this. They were the ones who actually wrote the first draft and uh, considered all the comments that came back from the reviewers. So and Nada gives his perspective on what he thinks is important and interesting. Um, a very, very um, well informed and thoughtful uh, project manager. Um, in fact, uh, I, was, I so much enjoyed chatting with him about uh, his work on the Pinbot guide that um, we've recorded a second uh, discussion about his work on P3 Express, uh, which will be coming up in the autumn. So um, watch out for that. So hope to see you in a month's time. No other questions, no other comments. Uh, so we'll give it a last couple of moments. Um, what I will also do, however, uh, is I will paste into the chat a couple of links. So uh, the first one I will paste in is an article on my website, um, which is about remote project management. So for anyone who is doing remote project management and wants to get a sense of or planning to do it or hoping to do it or fearing doing it, there's my article uh, giving my thoughts on remote project management. And there's another article which I think is slightly older on managing remote teams. So this is more about the, the kind of team aspect of it. Uh, so that is going into the chat now. And these will all be in the description below um, as well. Um, and I also wrote uh, and relatively recently updated an article on motivating project teams, not specifically in a virtual environment, but there's uh, a lot in there about motivation theory. If you really want to go more deeply into motivation theory, as I say, there is a course on the Management Courses YouTube channel, uh, which you can also uh, access at the Management Courses website, uh, and it's about motivation. The Management Courses website is, uh, let me grab a URL for that. Um, so that website has all of the courses slightly more easily, whoops, slightly more easily navigable. Um, so uh, you might want to, to look at the, the course material there. Um, and the last thing I'll link is, uh, again, you can get this from the Management Courses website uh, or you can watch on YouTube. 
and here is the YouTube playlist for the Teams course, which is currently rolling out the last few episodes on Tuesdays. Um, so these management courses things, basically, if you are used to my YouTube videos on this channel, uh, my PM courses, you'll recognize the style. It's basically me talking about a specific topic. The difference is that it's not project management, it's just management. Uh, and secondly, that week after week after week, builds into a coherent body of knowledge. Each video is completely self-contained. You don't, occasionally I cross-reference other videos, but then I do that on this channel too. But each video is completely self-contained in terms of you, you don't need to have seen another video to understand it. Um, uh, it's a gobbit of knowledge, uh, but you can kind of watch all of them, them or as many as you like, or you can use them as references. Um, so please do, uh, Firstly, give this live stream a like if you have enjoyed it. Secondly, subscribe to this channel if you're not already. Thirdly, do wander over to Management Courses and consider subscribing to that channel and watching some of those videos. Likes and subscribes are hugely valuable to me, as are comments uh, to any of my videos. I know a number of you comment, you know, I know Moses comments uh, and Patrick quite a lot. I think Nicholas does from time to time too. Um, it really helps YouTube to know that people are engaging and therefore it's something that maybe it should recommend to other people. So <clears throat> if you want to help me, um, the best thing you can possibly do uh, is send me a check for a million dollars. No, the best thing you can possibly do is just to like uh, the videos and comment on them <clears throat> and subscribe if you're not subscribed so that you hear about them. Um, Good. Uh, so, KB Castle, I can't remember what your name was. You did uh, announce your name. Ken Castle, there we are. Uh, says thank you. Um, you're very welcome. Um, I'm going to thank all of you for your time and attendance. Uh, it's great to have you on the live stream. I um, hope we can get even more uh, uh, on the stream in September when people will be back from their holidays. Uh, and also, of course, with the pinbot guide which i think hope will be a bit of a draw for some people um thank you once again i will be monitoring the chat for the next uh, few minutes so if you do have anything just pop it in the chat other than that i shall say goodbye and have a good summer and see you again in september thank you very much <laughs>